there we go. So over to you, Daniel. It even said recording in progress. That's pretty advanced. Um, is my volume okay? Sounds good. Yeah, cool. Let me just close the window once I... And share my screen. Cool. Can everybody see that all right? Looks, looks good to me. Cool. So I'm going to be talking about defensive programming in Go. And to get everybody on the same page, defensive programming, it essentially means that your program should be as resilient as possible to unforeseen circumstances. Uh, as in, you should aim to avoid bugs that you know might be there, but also bugs that you might not know about now or that might appear out of nowhere in the future. So as an introduction, I want to talk about what people mean when they say that Go or languages like Go are, are safe. And for example, as long as you don't use unsafe, Go already defends you from some um, bugs of this category. For example, no, you're not going to have any memory safety issues to worry about, no buffer overflows, for example, or no use after free. Um, the type system can also help if you avoid uh, using empty interfaces too much. But there's still some room for some defensive programming techniques, techniques, and I'm going to talk about some of them here. And I'm going to move uh, the Zoom window so I can see all of you. One sec. There you go. So the first example I want to talk about is the switch. And this is going to be a pretty classic, simple one. Um, so the idea is that if you have a switch, um, you know, suppose that you switch over a string and you handle two cases, what happens if you don't get one string? What happens if you don't get one of those strings? So I've got a bit of code here. Um, I'm going to actually split that. Nope. So if I go run one, so you can run it with one or two and that run, runs normally, but if I run it with three or some other string, it does nothing silently. So the idea is you can add a default case and then say something like println unknown string and then the string that you got. And this one is pretty silly, but I feel like it's a good starting point to get everybody on the same page as to uh, what these defensive techniques are about. So in general, include default cases unless you explicitly do not care about the default case. Um, and that's going to be based on what your logic should be. But in general, you should think about whether or not you, need, you should have a default case. And I think it's especially relevant when you're handling enums. Go doesn't have enums, but uh, it does have constants that have those IOTA values. Um, so having a default case means that, for example, if a new IOTA value appears and your switch was meant to be exhaustive, then the default will catch the new value and will warn you, hey, your code is out of date. You should add a new case. And it also applies to type switches. So for example, if you receive an empty interface and you, and you type switch over it, a default will help you, may help you catch unforeseen types that might otherwise be silently ignored. The second case is a bit trickier. It's about things that you know will never err. So here's a bit of example code. And I wrote this code and I was thinking to myself, well, this will probably not err in any way. And we can to do, we can open the code here. So if we run this code, what it does is uh, start the buffer with the string foo with a new line, copies that to standard output, and reads one byte, which presumably is legal because we just read a bunch of stuff from the buffer, and then looks at what the buffer currently contains. So you might expect this to print just, one, just the new line character, but it actually prints the empty string. And this is because we're silently ignoring this error. So. And apologies if my keyboard is a bit loud. I tried to move it a bit away, but we'll see. So if we do that, 
then it tells you unread byte, previous operation was not a successful read. Now, I'm not sure if that's a very helpful error because I did just read from it, but it does tell you that I assumed there would be no error, but there actually is one. And it's the same with io.copy, but I'm not gonna type the same code again. And th the idea is that if you think an error is impossible, I would say that in general, you should still uh, look at it and panic if it's not nil, because if you happen to be wrong, um, then you're gonna get silent breakage or maybe undefined behavior, or maybe some other kind of weird behavior that you never accounted for. And yes, panics are probably not a great way to deal with these situations, but I, I reckon it's a good default because if you get a panic, for example, in, when a user runs your program, they're most likely gonna file a bug with that uh, panic output. And then you can most likely then go and fix what happened. Um, and there's one case here that I think is a bit special, which is that there are some functions that do return errors, like for example, fumt.printf, uh, because what they do is they write to standard output or standard error, right? Or some other file, but by default, it's standard output. And it says, the docs for printf says, it returns the number of bytes written and any write error encountered. And the thing is, if you encounter a write error, an error when you're writing to standard output, I would say panicking or trying to handle that is probably not super useful because at, at that point, you probably can't show anything to the user anyway. So I think, ignoring those kind of errors in some cases can be okay. Um, but I, I would still say in general, uh, if you're not sure, I would still panic. Now, before I go on, any questions up to this point? Because I've got four more examples. So I wanna leave some space for questions. Cool. If anybody has questions uh, and they think they won't remember them later, you can type them in the chat and I'm gonna look later as well. So now we enter into shadowing. And I believe this is an idea I copied from Roger years ago, but it saved me a number of times. The idea is take a look at this code and see if you can spot a mistake. Ah. So the idea here is that we do a type switch on an interface V. Uh, we assign the, what do you call this type switch variable? Um, the specific type to X, um, to the name X, and then we use that, right? So let's go and use that. I've got the code here. So three, so the idea is that if it's an integer, we just want to convert that to a string and then print it with end. And otherwise, if it's a string, we're just gonna uh, quote the string and then print it. So it did something weird there. Instead of printing the quoted string, it printed what looks to be an interface. And the mistake here is that I did use X here to quote the string, but then I got confused and I used the parent empty interface uh, variable instead of the X to actually print. So that's unfortunate. Um, I could of course fix it if I change this to an X, then the code runs normally. But the thing is, I've got these two variables that are sort of getting in the way. I have to always remember to use the right one. And in some cases, for example, if I didn't have the quote here, then go, oh, go doesn't say anything. That's interesting, right? Because the declaration is here. Yeah, if I, if I never use X anywhere, it does warn me, but it's still, it's still possible to mess up and use the wrong variable. So the idea is that you instead shadow. So instead of having both names, you replace one name with the other. So in here you can do this, and then we fix the code. And then it's basically impossible to use the empty interface, what you could call the parent variable. You always use the, the one that has a specific type. And then it still works. And it's basically impossible for me to use the wrong one. Um, and... I would say that the way this helps you is by reducing the amount of names that you've got in scope. So you have to re remember less things in your head. And especially when the two variables are very, very similar uh, because they refer to the same value, but with different variable types, um, only having one of those, I'll, I would say, reduces the chances that you're gonna pick the wrong one. And there's also, you can also apply this at multiple levels. For example, suppose that you've got a function that takes an arbitrary ASD expression, which is an interface, you type switch over that, 
Um, and then the first shadowed expression is of type composite literal. And then you range over the composite literals expressions and then you shadow again. Um, now you might not want to do this, for example, if you still want to access the parent, but if you, also, if you always want to work with exactly one expression at a time, then this can be a way to only have one expression variable in scope. Um, one caveat that I think should be pointed out is that this doesn't work with function parameters because function parameters, they, they are in the function body scope. So if you try to write code that, for example, shadows a parameter with uh, colon equals with, for example, a type assertion, that is going to fail because what you're doing is essentially assigning to the node variable because you're in the same scope instead of creating a variable that shadows in an asset scope. And then when you assign, it goes back to being a, um, not an empty interface. It goes back to being a node interface. So in this case, it tells you type A state of node has no field or method ELTs um, because the type of node in that line is still just an interface. It's not a struct type. Um, you can also use a variant of this uh, to, for example, go around this problem of not being able to shadow, with, shadow within the same scope, um, which is that you can add an extra scope, which isn't necessary in one way, but in another way, it allows you to, for example, shadow, or in this case, it allows you to declare a buffer, a buffer variable, use it within a short bit of code, and then not have it in your scope again in the future. Um, because you might be worried that, for example, uh, you might forget that you shouldn't use the buffer from this point afterwards. Um, but then you might um, declare debug in the parent scope for the result of this little operation and then save that. But everything else is in a child scope and that just disappears. Another example is invariance. Um, and da -da 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 I think I forgot to show this bit of code. Oh no, I did show it, nice. Another example is invariance. So we've got a function that, that um, given a, a list of names and a number of names to pick at random, it will pick those names at random and then uh, print them. So got the code. Now I run this code in a number of ways. Uh, first, what I do is a list of four numbers uh, also four names. I want to pick three random ones. Uh, that works just fine. Now, what if I give it a number zero? Then that does nothing. And what if I give it an empty list of, of names? Uh, then that fails because it will pick a random number between zero and zero, and then that will be zero. And then it will, oh, no, not even that. Math rand will say invalid argument. So that will just panic. So what I think you could do in this scenario is say, uh, you could write a go doc, for example, pick at random picks uh, a number of random names from the given list and then write in plain English, some invariants, for example, uh, names, names must not be empty number uh, must not be zero. There's multiple ways you could write this, but I think um, I think short, short and simple English statements is probably the best way uh, as a default. So if if we write this, then the person looking at the API and the docs can know this invariance, but we can also uh, check them, assert them. So for example, no. panic. Empty. If number, we could also check for it being negative. Panic number must be positive. I'm getting a bit of echo. Is anybody's mic on? Okay, so that works now. So if I disable this one. Yep, so it seems like both assert assertions are working correctly. So the idea here is that if you should, if you have invariants, you should document them and ideally also check them and panic if they're not being followed. Because in, in, in the bit of code that I just showed you, it's still panicked in a pretty 
obvious way. Uh, but other bits of code, maybe it's going to run for some time and then maybe crash the whole machine with an out-of-memory um, panic. Or maybe it's going to run forever. Or maybe it's going to give the wrong re result. So I think if you can, if it's cheap enough, I think it's better to check um, your invariants and then panic if they're not true. And I think this is especially relevant with something that's quite common in Go, which is that things may be nil, uh, especially interfaces. So if you're not, if if your API does not support a parameter being nil, uh, you should you should check that. Would you uh, do that with receiver types too? That's a good question. Hmm. I I guess not because it would become very repetitive. Um, I think I think by default people assume that receivers do not allow nil um, unless documented otherwise. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't check for personally. I wouldn't check for non-nil things when you know we expect things to be non-nil in general, like when they're when they're types with with a normal constructor, because otherwise it'd be very boring. <laughs> Yeah, you may be right. Um, at the same time, like I would say defensive programming is up to your personal choice. It depends on how defensive you want to be with your code. I would agree that in general, I'm not going to add nil assertions to every function I write. Uh, but if it's a function that is particularly fragile or important, I might. What one place I like to add nil, nil checks is when they're part of a struct, because it's really easy to to, to make a struct and you know only fill in some of the members. Yep, I agree. Any questions about these last couple of sections? So it was invariance and shadowing. Cool. So I'll move on to the next one, and uh, we're getting to juicier ones here. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna a bit I'm gonna go a bit slower. Um, but the, I'm going to post these slides later um, if you want to check this code again. So the idea is that you can embed, if when you declare a struct type in Go, you can embed another struct, and then its methods get promoted to you. So in this case, if I embed a big dot int, it has a method on Marshall JSON to um, have custom logic to unmarshal JSON values. So in this case, a big int wants to unmarshal itself as a big integer, right? So it's going to decode a JSON number, but then keep arbitrary precision for it instead of what Go would normally do, which is pick um, a fixed size, a fixed sized integer or float, and then just limit it at that precision. And suppose that I, what I want to do is I want to override that method logic with some custom logic that I want. In this case, um, what I want to do is print something and then allocate the big end because I'm using a pointer, um, and then call its on Marshall JSON. So I'm, I'm sort of like being a middleman. So let's go look at the code. So the bit of code that I just showed you in the slide is this. So we look, we use embedder alone, and embedder is what embeds big end. And embedder, then we call unmarshal with an integer in JSON with a variable of that type. And then you can see with the print that our unmarshal JSON method was called. So far, so good. Uh, where it gets tricky is what if we declare a new type, a new named type? whose underlying type is embedder. And if you run the same logic here, so on Marshall a JSON integer into that new variable of type new embedder, uh, you get a panic. And the reason you get a panic is quite confusing. And there's actually a, a bug about this, which I'm going to link to later. But the idea is that when you declare a new named type in Go, it starts with an empty method set. So it starts with zero methods. And then it looks at the underlying type of the right thing. And the underlying type of embedder is this. It's the struct with a big end. It does not have this unmarshal JSON, because this unmarshal JSON is, is attached to the embedder named type. It's not attached to, the, to its underlying type. So new embedder 
gets this underlying type and then promotes begins on Marshall JSON. So essentially, new and better skips over our man in the middle uh, on Marshall JSON method and goes straight for begins on Marshall JSON. And this panics because begins will be nil. It's a nil pointer. And then you get a nil pointer dereference. Um, did everybody follow that? It's a bit confusing. I'm not sure if I did a very good job of explaining that. <laughs> yes, that's clear. Okay. I mean, you uh, might want to explain when this situation might actually arise. Right. So there's actually a rise at work. Um, it was it was across packages. So we had we had one package that declared embedder as a custom big end. And I believe they're unmarshalling what they did was something like first on quote the string or something like that. But then another package said, oh, we want to attach some new methods to that type. So they did uh, like uh, big end two or something like that. And then they used a new named type and then without knowing that it was causing panics. Um, it's a bit of a niche case, but it's, it's I still think it's reasonably realistic. Um, now, going back to the slides, um, I would say that struct embedding can be useful, um, but I would be careful with using it to hide or override methods uh, because that, if you do it the simple way that I just showed you, there are ways to skip it over. And you might, like for example, a downstream user might do that on purpose to break your API uh, and access unexported things, or they might do so by mistake. Uh, because what happened to us at work was by mistake. There's an upstream issue uh, that you can look at. Uh, it's 41685. Uh, and there's two solutions proposed here. Um, because when I filed this issue about a year ago, I wasn't really sure where the blame should be put. Is it, is it a problem in the spec? Is it a problem in the compiler? Is it a problem with how I'm writing code? So the first solution that I believe Brian Mills suggested is a vet check. So for example, imagine that you write embedder uh, to override a, an unmarshal JSON method, but then somebody else does the um, new type, new named type declaration that skips over that overriding method. Then VET could say, hey, be careful because your method on Marshall JSON refers to the embedded begins on Marshall JSON, not to the embedder on Marshall JSON. Um, and then possibly there might be a way to ignore that VED warning, but I think having this warning by default is a good thing because it's, it's sort of a gotcha that I don't think anybody would see coming. Another idea is, which I believe came from Ian Lance Taylor, is to add another level of, of types so that you can safely override the method. And theoretically, a user cannot jump over that like I just showed you. And I have a bit of code here to show that. So I hit it at the bottom of, of this file because I knew I wouldn't be able to write it from memory. <laughs> so now we've got, we've got safe embedder. And instead of embedding begins directly, it embeds private embedder, which does the actual logic of embedding begins and overriding its own Marshall JSON. And the reason for this is because if somebody declares a new named type whose um, whose underlying type is safe and better, then the underlying type will end up being um, will end up being struct of private and better, which will still have our own Marshall JSON. So let me show you. So wherever we used and better, we want to use safe and better. And if we run that, both run exactly the same, which is either using it directly or trying to skip over its overriding. And I know this is kind of confusing, but if any of you want to dig more into this, uh, I believe you should go look at that issue. And in particular, the bits of the thread where it quotes the spec, because once you understand what, a, what declaring a type, what a named type and so on, what the definitions of those things are, then I think it gets a bit, a bit clearer to understand why this happens. Before I go into the next uh, slightly confusing example, any questions about this one? But oh, there's a bit in the chat. 
yeah, I mean, um, using a pointer receiver, it, it just happened to be the example. It couldn't, it could be without the pointer receiver if I used some other method. Um, I think the only important bit here is method sets um, and method sets can also be without pointer pointers. I think the real gotcha here is that if you define a new type, it might still have methods. That, that, that was a surprise to me when I first encountered it. Yeah, it's, it's sort of confusing. It's like it's two stages, right? It starts with zero methods and then it gets methods promoted from embedding uh, from the underlying type. And then you can attach new methods via uh, func declarations, right? Uh, so the cause is that the underlying type is determined recursively. Um, mm, you could say so. Um, it's like, it's like, for example, take this case, right? Type new and better, safe and better. So the underlying type of new and better is safe and better's underlying type. And what is safe and better's underlying type? So you have to go to its declaration and here it is. It's this. You can think of it as the first type underneath that name type that is not a named type itself. So in this case, it's this struct type. And then um, Go works out the, the promoting of methods from that, from that underlying type. And in this case, it's going pr to promote private embedders methods. And what are private embedders methods? This method. Whereas in the other case, what you promoted was this, and then you got begins method, which is not what you want. So I wouldn't say it's recursive because it's only at one level, um, at least in this example. But the question is um, which underlying type you want to use, this one or this one? So the last example I've got um, is about uh, validity, validity lifetime. And this is a difficult name to say. Um, I couldn't come up with a good name for this, but essentially, um, suppose that you have a type called converter, and it essentially is an, an implementation of string conf dot i to a, which is just converting an integer to a string, but in a way that it reuses a buffer, so that, for example, it doesn't allocate over time. So what it does is um, it keeps a buffer to reuse, and anytime you call it, it's going to use string conf dot append end on that buffer. Um, and append end is just a, it's just the underlying implementation of um, I to A or format end, but it, it uses the buffer that you give it. So uh, it's sort of lower level in that way. And we just format the integer that we're given on base 10. And we call it, we call a callback, a callback function that the user gave us to view that result. And then we uh, reset the buffer back to length equals zero. And we want to use a callback because this buffer is to be reused for future calls, right? So if we just returned that buffer, uh, the user might hold on to it and keep using it. Um, <clears throat> whereas we want to know exactly when they're done using that buffer. So we can then you know, use it for the next call and so on. Uh, so the, the go dog reads, i to a converts i to a base 10 string form calling v with its resulting bytes. The bytes are valid until v returns. Uh, so the contract here is you give me a view function and it's valid for you to look at those bytes as long as view is running, as long as the view function is running. As soon as you return, you cannot use those bytes again. Uh, because if you do, that's going to be um, illegal. It's going to be racy. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be illegal. It's going to be invalid. So here's a bit of code that implements that. Run six. So I start with two simple calls. Um, I create a new one and I ask it, please convert the integer one, two, three to a string. And then I print that and same with four, five, six. <clears throat> and this works just fine. You can see the numbers here. Um, but then I do something um, nasty, which is I hold on to those bytes. So I, I ask it to convert the, the number one, one, two, two, three, 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 four, four. And I keep those bytes 
uh, I print them just after, just after uh, my function returns, which in theory is illegal. And then I convert another number. Um, I do nothing with that, doesn't matter. And then I print those originally kept bytes again. And what this does is <clears throat> uh, shortly after, because the implementation happens to not reuse that buffer straight away, it still works. You can see the, the numbers here. But the later print, notice that it got corrupted because, <clears throat> because we printed another number, in this case, 987. And it corrupted the first three bytes, and the rest of the bytes are still there. So this is not unexpected because the documentation does say it's invalid for you to use those bytes after view returns, right? But the question is, can we do anything to prevent the user from falling into this um, into this gotcha and not noticing? Because, for example, if I use this code, if I use this code alone and I run my program, it looks correct. Um, I got exactly the result I wanted, but my, my program is illegal. Um, but I might not notice with some simple tests and that it might fail in production when many requests are coming in uh, concurrently. <clears throat> so something you could do is, for example, when we reset the buffer back to length zero to be reused later with its capacity, we could also empty it. We could set its contents to zero. So I'm going to do it in a hacky way here, but you can think of many other ways that would be more efficient or that would support larger buffers. But you could do, whoops. When you make a byte slice, it it's initialized to zero memory. So why is that not? Hmm, make, oh, R, that's F, V. So if I run this again, um, so essentially whenever um, view returns, I'm gonna zero the buffer. I'm gonna make it invalid. Um, and then if I try to use it shortly afterwards, I'm gonna get nothing because the buffer is just full of zeros, uh, it's got nothing. Um, so this is not particularly costly, at least in this particular case, but it will help users quickly notice uh, mistakes like these. So the idea is that if a value should no longer be valid for use, uh, make its contents explicitly invalid in some cheap way, um, because you don't wanna make it very expensive to add checks like these, right? Any questions about this last example? I mean, my question is like, you, you're, if you're doing this reuse buffer, you're kind of doing that to, to, to because because you're in a because efficiency matters here, right? So you're trying to shave cycles off, and then you know actually that that reuse thing that that overriding the you know the value does actually you know, make it less efficient. So you're kind of shaving off some of the advantages that you're getting. So what do you think? It, I mean, what's your take on that? Yeah, to be fair, this is a very simple example. Um, in reality, you would imagine I2A being a much more expensive operation. Um, the actual case where this came up was in a JSON tokenizer. So a, a JSON decoder of tokens, and you ask it, give me the next token, give me the next token, give me the next token. And the API says a token is only valid until the next next call. So if you ask me for a token and I give you A, and then you ask me for another token and I give you B, then A is no longer valid, right? But how do you actually enforce that? Because if you're buffering uh, a, a few tokens at a time, uh, just because uh, your buffer is big enough for them, the user might not notice that. Maybe their JSON maybe their JSON inputs are small enough that they never run into problems with that, right? So the you ended up with something like, um, well, I'm not gonna type, try to write it down, but you essentially ended up with a function with a method next that started by invalidating the last token that it gave you. And I, I believe the way it invalidated was by setting the first byte to null or something like that. And then if you looked at that token byte slice and you saw the first byte being null, 
then you knew that it had been invalidated and then you might panic if the user tries to use it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the first byte being null, for sending one byte is, 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 is good. Um, do you think that, so there are some other APIs in the standard library that do this, that, that have a similar kind of issue? Like I'm um, thinking of bytes.scanner for, uh, sorry, uh, buffio.scanner. Um, do you think that should do the same thing? It's probably too late now, right? That's interesting. I just changed it to do what you said, uh, but I guess null bytes are sort of invisible in Go because strings are not <laughs> null terminated. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, yeah, existing APIs. I mean, I think it depends on what the API contract contract is. If it says something about the contract of the validity of the data, then I think you can insert invalidations like that. If it doesn't say anything like that, then you're going to be breaking users if you change the contract, right? Yeah, maybe we should do that. I have tried to make small changes to the standard library over the years, and many of them have changed. So I think, I think I've slowed down on, on trying to do that for now. Uh, I remember once I tried to make the JSON library a little bit more consistent with how it handles, um, I think it was um, how it handles duplicate names. And then uh, Joe came back and said, hey, you broke like 15 tests within Google. Can you please revert that? I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway, so the last section that I want to talk about it. Oh, somebody also left a comment. Oh, cool. So the last bit I want to talk about is from all that I just showed you, you might say that's all great, but I'm not gonna remember all these little details when I write Go code and that's reasonable. Um, so what can we automate? So the first one about switches, you could possibly enforce what you could call exhaustive switches, meaning they need to include all the cases and a default case when you're switching over an enum-like type, as in a type that has IOTA values. Um, and you would cover a, a few cases with that, but it, I don't think it would be a general solution because some other classes of switches also need to be exhaustive, right? Um, so it's a matter of you remembering which switches need to be exhaustive. <clears throat> another, the, another example we talked about was never errors. And there is a tool called error check that warns you about every single error that you ignore. But like we said, some errors can be okay to ignore. Not many, but some of them can. Um, so I haven't found a way to actually detect those. Um, so I still think this falls under code review. If you're reviewing code, maybe there should be a bot that as part of the code review tells you, hey, this person added this line that's ignoring an error, please double check it to make sure that ignoring this error is actually safe. Uh, I think that would be useful, but actually failing the build if an error is ignored, I think is, is too aggressive because sometimes it's fine. Another example is shadowing. Um, so I believe enforcing this would be a bit harsh because I, this feels like more of a style decision uh, because the, the code without shadowing is not wrong in any way. It's just slightly more prone to human errors, right? Um, perhaps a linter could look at the amount of names you've got in, in any scope and maybe give you an error if you have too many names at once. But the question then is how many names is too many? Um, I don't think that can be a question answered for everybody. For me, at least, if I have to keep more than, let's say, 10 names at once in a scope, that's probably the point where I'm going to be making mistakes. But for other people, it might be less or more. Uh, it's hard to say. We also talked about invariance. Um, and some languages use uh, what I think is called invariant programming. And it essentially means that you write your invariance as code. So you might write them in some sort of Boolean logic code as part of the documentation. And then maybe statically or at runtime, th those uh, invariants are actually asserted, they're checked. I, but I don't think Go would be a good fit for this because Go tends to be more about the um, smaller spec side of things. So I, I personally don't think this will fit Go, but maybe some people could write a tool that reads Go docs and sort of does some NLP natural language processing on the English invariants and then writes code to check those and panic otherwise. And, you know, as part of a go generate step, I would use that if, if that nerd snipe caught anybody. 
um, of course, you, you run into problems where, like, what's the standard English way of writing things, right? Um, if, I, if only everyone wrote doc comments as good as yours, Daniel. <laughs> well, these are examples for a talk. Um, they, they do not represent reality. <laughs> Um, another example we talked about was struct embedding. Uh, and I do think um, the vet check is, is a good idea. Uh, I believe the spec could be a little bit clearer because the spec is technically right, but you have to read, you have to remember multiple pieces of the spec to realize why this edge case happens. So maybe calling out the edge case explicitly would be a good idea. And then maybe showing the pattern of private embedder if you want to avoid the, the trap of the edge case. I think that would be worthwhile adding to the spec. And then finally, the validity of uh, variables. I think, I think this one depends too much on, on what your API looks like. Because for some APIs, maybe they use callbacks. For some other APIs, maybe they use a, a close method. Uh, some other APIs, maybe they say uh, invalid after the context is canceled. Uh, maybe invalidating is as simple as setting one byte. Maybe it's more complex than that. Um, so I think it's going to depend too much on what your code looks like, but perhaps this pattern of actually invalidating a value explicitly um, following what the doc says, maybe that could be a recommended pattern. Um, and I've been following it in a few places, but I also admit that it's a fairly obscure thing to want to do. Um, because in general, the lifetime of a Go value is just until it gets garbage collected. Um, and usually you only need to uh, get away from that if you want to be smarter about, oh, I want to avoid allocations. And then you're sort of reusing memory and it's, it gets more complicated. And that is it for me. Um, any questions? Or does anybody want me to go back to any of the slides? Because I did go a little fast. nobody has any questions that was a that was a great talk thank you daniel very much it was really interesting yeah it was thanks very much i'm going to uh, stop the recording now as well